All right, well, let me start by uh, thanking Stephanie for asking me to uh, speak to you um, during this seminar. Back in the summer, we talked um, about some ideas for um, this particular presentation. And now that I have an administrative hat as well as a teaching and research hat, it's nice to be able to put time on my schedule and say, I have to think about this now because I have a talk next week. So it kind of forced me to think about some things I wanted to think about, which is always nice. I also wanted to thank the students who we talked with earlier about some of these issues. This is in the slide even before, obviously, I talked to the students. They really did great in the award. That was a very enjoyable conversation that we had before, uh, before the public talk. So let me explain, first of all, the uh, title of my talk. This is actually an homage to a book that came out a couple of years ago, a book by Daniel Kahneman, who many of you might know as a cognitive scientist, and many of you might know as also a Nobel, Nobel Prize winner in economics. In fact, there are two cognitive scientists who have uh, Nobel Prizes in economics. <coughs> Daniel Kahneman's one. Anybody know the other one? Herb Simon is the other one. So there have been two. So uh, we tend to get recognition in other fields, which is always kind of a nice thing. But he has this book meant for a popular audience where he explains some of these ideas about the cognitive biases that we experience when we think about things in a quick sort of way versus a slow sort of way. So I'm going to shamelessly steal from him mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> give, um, as an homage, my, uh, my title to uh, the same kind of uh, idea. All right, so let's start by thinking about language in a relatively fast way in terms of a time scale that might be just on the order of a few minutes. And a lot of our conversations obviously occur in this way. We have conversations almost every day with people we'll never see again. We want something from them, we want to buy a candy bar, <laughs> we want to buy some gas, whatever it is. We may just have a very short interaction with them. And in fact, this is what we actually know more about than the slow type of, of, of conversion that we're talking about here in a few moments. Fast is nice because you can actually do this in the laboratory. So a number of paradigms have evolved over several decades for studying this in the laboratory. Collectively, they're referred to as referential communication paradigms or tasks. And one of them was devised by my um, graduate advisor, Sam Wexford, back in the 60s working with a social psychologist, Bob Krauss, and this is actually, I've, I've taken some of the uh, illustrations from their Scientific American paper from the late 70s, uh, where they uh, describe this, this approach, because it's been used quite widely, uh, both by them and by later researchers, trying to understand uh, conversation and uh, interaction on the order of just maybe a few minutes, maybe like half an hour or so. So imagine a situation where you have two subjects who are separated by a screen so they can hear but not see each other. One of them has been given a, a, a sheet of, of strangely shaped objects and they're numbered. And the job of the so-called director is to describe each of these figures to the so-called matcher in such a way that the matcher will arrive at the same idea of what shape is being referred to and number that particular um, uh, shape appropriately on his or her piece of paper. So here we have this kind of weird object and the person saying it's kind of like a spaceman's helmet, it's got two things, and ideally that's creating, given the list of alternatives that the um, matcher is looking at, enough information to be able to arrive at that same uh, interpretation of what object is being referred to there. So not surprisingly, adults are pretty good at this. We're, we're, we're pretty good at using language. But what's interesting is what happens if you repeat this paradigm, this task, over several trials using the same two people and the same shapes, which you're going to see are some interesting behaviors that will take place as trials go forward. What you'll see is a change in the way the object is being described. So let's say this is our object in this case, not an object that you or I have a name for, and neither do our subjects at the beginning of the experiment. So one person might say, looks like an hourglass with legs on each side, using many words to describe this thing during the first trial of the experiment. In a second trial, the manager or the director might just say, hourglass with the legs, a shortening of the original form. In a third trial, it may be shortened down to hourglass-shaped thing. On a fourth trial, it's just referred to as a one-word script the hourglass. 
So these two individuals, Matcher and Director, across a series of trials, have arrived at a common way of referring to this object that previously they had no reference for. But they have together worked out a way, a code, if you will, for referring to that object. So this is what you see over and over again. You see this decline in the number of words per reference across trials where you keep the natural and director the same, and of course the objects are the same. This idea of shortening is now referred to more technically as lexical entrainment. So Susan Brennan and Herb Clark gave it a better name than just shortening. This actually is a better description for what's going on here. And there might, in fact, as we're going to see, be many kinds of entrainment that might occur. So people can do this. More specifically, adults can do this. And the question is, well, are you born being able to do this? Or is this a skill that people develop over time? You could repeat the exact same experiment using children. And there you get very different kinds of results. So now we've got uh, two, two young children, and they're given the uh, wooden squares that uh, are in a dispenser, and the job is to arrange them on these little spindles here, so it's a little bit easier for the kids to work with. They don't have to have a number of things or anything like that. So you might have this kind of weird shape, and the child might make a kind of uh, idiosyncratic uh, descriptor for it, daddy's shirt, which you think, well, daddy's shirt could be in many different kinds of forms. And so we either have a master with a possibly shirt-like shape, but not the same shape that the... Uh, the first child was thinking of. So we see a much more egocentric kind of speech. And crucially, if you repeat the experiment across trials, we don't see the entrainment that occurs when adults are given this kind of task. So we can actually map out the results from uh, kids of varying ages and see some very different kinds of patterns. So what's being shown here, once again, is, I'm sorry, in this case, it's the number of errors made on each, each trial across you know, quite a few trials, up to 16 trials. And the top line is showing how kids who are in kindergarten are doing across time. So the adults shorten things down and have very low error rates in general. The kindergarten kids <laughs> don't ever get any better. The number of errors they show in terms of matching uh, their objects stays fairly high. First grade children start high, but get better over time. And third and fifth grade children are doing even better, suggesting that whatever is going on, whatever adults are doing in this reference communication task, is something they have learned in terms of using communicate, using language to communicate with other people in a socially um, helpful way in order to refer, for example, to objects of varying kinds. So in fact, we do see relatively egocentric speech in young children and then perhaps more socially directed speech uh, developing as children uh, get older that would explain the kinds of results that are found in a task like this. So these results uh, have been widely discussed, and this whole idea of using a, a reference communication paradigm has been used by, by a whole bunch of researchers. Another paradigm in which this is often used is a tangram task. So it's very similar, but now we have a bit more structure in terms of the actual materials that are being used. I believe this was first used by Herb Clark and Yana Wilkes-Gibbs back in the uh, mid-80s. And they did a whole series of experiments using, once again, these rather difficult to uh, describe figures. They can't all be described, but you typically have to have a fairly lengthy description to begin with. So this one might be the very happy graduate. This one might be the, the bunny man leaning, leaning uh, against a tree. Uh, this one might be the ice skater. So you can imagine different kinds of terms that could be applied to these things. And once again, what Clark and Wilkes Gibbs found was that uh, a director and a matcher will arrive at and use these uh, codes, these shortened phrases that uh, refer to these objects. They will collaborate in order to arrive at language that um, can refer to these, to these, to these uh, objects. Bill, do you have a question? Or? Yeah, I was just wondering if there's a good idea of what it is in children that prevents them from doing this. Is it memory? Uh, 
Yeah, I don't really follow the children literature, so there might well be somebody in the room who knows this better than I do, but there's probably uh, a number of different factors. One might even be like the theory of mind, right? If you don't really understand that somebody could perceive what you think of as being obviously daddy's shirt and, and, and seeing it the same way as you, that, that, that could be a problem. But there, are, there definitely could be memory issues as well. That's a really good issue, yeah. Yeah, if you, if you have more words to describe things, you have more to work with. So there might be um, a whole bunch of things. And once again, there might, in fact, be published work on this. I just don't read that literature, so I can't tell you for sure exactly. But it's easy to imagine a whole bunch of cognitive and social variables that might play a role here. Okay. So when you do this, when you use a tangram task, you see something very similar to what uh, Glucksberg and, and Krauss found. You see that the, the mean number of words uh, used by the director is going down. And, and these tangrams can be kind of hard to describe. The average is 40 on trial one, going down to 20 on trial two, down to 10 on trial three. So it really does seem to be the case that people quite rapidly converge upon ways to refer to um, these strange objects that they're having to uh, identify to each other. And you see this in the, in the real world as well. That is, if the game show is the real world, I have to be a fan of Jeopardy. And I, I watch it frequently, and I'm always intrigued by the way that these three uh, players will, in, in fact, do this as well. On the very, the very first time that somebody might choose from this row, that's right, this column, they'll probably use the entire term. Alex, I'll have the planet Earth for 200. But a later contestant might say, just planet Earth. Just, just planet Earth. And then the third person might just say Earth. And it might stay Earth all the way through. So one word reference for what was originally perhaps three words. So um, you see this actually across a whole variety of contexts, not just in the laboratory but out in uh, at least uh, the game show world as well as one example of some of the where this kind of thing actually occurs. So there are a whole bunch of names for what we're talking about here. Lots of people study behavioral change over time, and what you see whenever two people are interacting is that they become more like each other. Not just in the language they use, but even behavioral things like foot rubbing or face rubbing. It's really kind of amazing how in sync people become over time, both linguistically and non-linguistically. And, and just in terms of taking a sense of, of the names for all of this, there's a whole bunch of these. Here's 11 that I was able to think of fairly quickly. There are probably even more than this. But they're all kind of suggesting the same thing, that over time, even across short periods of time, we actually do see people um, moving together in terms of the language they use or in terms of their behaviors. So this is obviously a major issue for a psychologist to try to understand. And over time, people try to explain this in a number of different ways. The traditional way of thinking about this was to refer to what's called audience-centered design. This is the work of Herb Clark and Clark's student, Susan Brennan, who's actually spoken in this building. She was our keynote speaker for STMD about eight years ago, I think. Side effects in this course, book of the zone. And then uh, both Herb Clark's students and Susan's students have uh, kind of pushed this point of view as well. The students in the class now have been really brainwashed into this point of view because they read 40 pages of a long chapter in which it was described in great detail that there is this experimental uh, body of work that does suggest that we as human beings take into account the other person's point of view and carefully craft and tailor our messages in such a way that our audience is going to understand what things are being said. However, there have been challenges to this particular point of view. One comes from the work of uh, Sid Horton and Boas Kesar at University of Chicago. And they argue for what they refer to as monitoring and adjustment. The problem with the audience-centered view is that it's very cognitively expensive. You really have to keep track of what the other person knows and what you have together worked out in terms of, for example, referring to objects. 
and using a different kind of paradigm, it's called a visual world paradigm, which people are wearing eye trackers, and you know exactly where they're looking. They gave people similar tasks to these matching director tasks. And what they found was that people would look at objects that their listeners could not possibly see what are referred to as privileged objects as opposed to shared objects and solving some sort of task they were given together. They shouldn't be looking to those objects because they're irrelevant for helping the uh, other subject solve the problem that uh, the, the, the uh, subject has been given. And so the way that Horton and Case are talking about this is, is to assume that we are in fact egocentric. We don't take the perspective of the other in, into account when we create our utterances. And then we can repair this. We can, after making our egocentric uh, judgments, then modify our actual linguistic statement in order to take that other person's point of view into account. But initially, we don't do that. We, we actually are kind of very much in our own little world before we're able to then adapt that for the point of view of somebody else. Another uh, idea that's been proposed here is being referred to as interactive alignment. This is the work of Pickering and Garrett from about a decade ago. And it's a much simpler explanation in many respects. They assume that the kinds of effects I've told you about here so far are simply the result of priming. That a great deal of what we're talking about here doesn't have to be explained in terms of any sort of theory of mind or uh, audience-centered design, but simply that we are going to be primed both behaviorally and linguistically by other people. And that can account for a lot of the effects that have been described using these other kinds of approaches. So we have a variety of positions that have been staked out. And a few years ago, my colleague and I, Rick Dale, my colleague Rick Dale and I, there we go, um, were talking about this, because it really did seem like there was you know, only one of these was, was true, according to most theorists, that one of these was correct. And, and Rick and I said, well, gee, you know, it probably matters a great deal what you're doing, and it probably matters very crucially um, uh, that there might be factors that, that would affect how you might choose to, to um, craft utterances. And so we actually applied for and got a grant from the National Science Foundation to do some research on this. And, the research involved actually not just Rick and me, but also the Tolleson and uh, Andrew. Did Andrew here? No. Shame my hand. So Andrew <laughs> Holden was also one of our co PIs and supported a number of graduates, including Gina, who was, was actually on this grant as well. And um, one of the projects involved taking a paradigm that had been used quite a bit by Haywood and, 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 and putting out the computer and actually allowing us to do lots of different studies with it. So, they're going to be able to assist especially well, but essentially, uh, subjects were given a task of moving objects around on a screen using uh, a mouse so they could pick up and, and move objects. So uh, they might be told uh, through headphones that they're supposed to move the uh, paper clip in the pauldron on top of the stop sign, and they would move things using their mouse. We had a whole bunch of variations that we did on this uh, theme using real Confederates, using recordings of Confederates, um, and lots of interesting findings. The one that's really relevant for our purposes here, and one that we uh, talk about in a 2010 paper, is that if you manipulate time pressure, you see big differences in what people do. When we told subjects they could take as much time as they needed to craft the requests made to their uh, conversational partners, we saw them using very explicitly disambiguation strategies. In the paradigm that I've shown you, some of the um, uh, directions can admit to more than one course of behavior. And what you see people doing is very much taking the point of view of the other person in mind in situations where they had the luxury of being able to do this. And that was evidence that people were taking this audience-centered point of view, supporting Brennan and Clark. However, we also did an experiment in which we gave people time pressure. They actually had a little very annoying counter on the screen that was counting down. And they were losing points the longer they took to, uh, to, to respond. And under those circumstances, we saw people engaging in a very different, what we call an ease of production strategy. 
they would say things that were technically correct in terms of directions to their matcher, but were sometimes not entirely unambiguous, suggesting that the time pressure was causing them to become more egocentric. So it's possible, we argue, that some of the, results, some of the data that others have collected for um, uh, this idea of adjustment might be that the tasks are relatively difficult. And that other situations where people don't have cognitive constraints and perhaps plenty of time, people may appear to be more more uh, of taking their, their audience into account. And so it might not just be that any of these theories are correct. It might be that they're all correct. This is going to matter crucially what kind of situation a person finds himself or herself in. And so it might well be the case that we are egocentric sometimes. And we are audience-centered on, on other occasions depending upon these additional factors. Well, let's turn now and talk about conversing slow. We talked about fast in terms of what happens during the course of a normal psychology experiment. But now let's think about a time scale that's very different. A time scale lasting from several hours to possibly several decades. So now we're talking about change over time which is good because the point of this seminar is talking about dynamics. So it's good that we're, that we're bringing this factor in. But it really does reflect a real, a, a crucial issue with regard to the research that we, we've discussed here so far. Lab experiments are great. We can learn all kinds of things about language and behavior, but they're unfolding on the order of tens of minutes. A couple of sophomores come in to get credit. They do some tasks for a while. You give them the credit, they flee. <laughs> pretty much the standard sort of thing. And that's great. You do, in fact, learn all kinds of things that way. The problem, as we all know, is that the real world, the world that you and I live in on a daily basis, is not temporally constrained the same way. We have conversations with other people on a daily basis, some of whom we have known for very, very long periods of time. And so the question is, well, the processes that we've discussed so far, of egocentrism or adjustment, they play themselves out in the same way across longer periods of time. Are they the same mechanisms that we see across short periods of time, or might they be quite different? The problem with talking about conversing slow, as I'm calling it here, there's much less data. So I'm going to have to give you some um, I'm going to have to appeal to your uh, imaginations and give you some scenarios to think about because I think it really does suggest that we do want to not just talk about what happens when people do uh, short-term experiments, but what you might see over longer periods of time. What kinds of theoretical um, frameworks do we have for working with here? One framework has to do with something called common ground. So let's create a common ground situation here. Let's, let's create a world. In that world, we have a person named Mary. And Mary is her own complex person. She has all sorts of knowledge, beliefs, attitudes, experiences. Now let's bring a second person into this world named Susan. And once again, she's her own person, a whole bundle of complex knowledge, beliefs, attitudes, experiences. Let's say that Mary and Susan meet and get to know each other. And they hit it off and start spending time together in this kind of Venn diagram way of describing common ground, what we're talking about here is this middle area, the overlap in knowledge, beliefs, attitudes, and experiences. And that's what, yeah, don't fun with that. Uh, <laughs> that's what uh, is often referred to as common ground. Now, this is kind of an unfortunate term because common ground has a very kind of informal sense, meaning consensus. So a diplomat might say, we found common ground with, with, with the Iranians, something like this. But what Clark actually means is something a little bit different and, and, and a bit more specific. So he first uses this term in a technical way in a book chapter he published with Marshall back in the early 80s. And the idea here is we're talking about not just mutual knowledge, but crucially shared mutual knowledge. Not just what Mary knows that Susan knows, but crucially, what Mary knows that Susan knows that Mary knows, <laughs> and vice versa. Um, 
I realize it's late and we need to wrap our heads around this. So hopefully <laughs> your brains are going to explode when you try to unpack that. But hopefully you can see the idea here. It is important that there be shared mutual knowledge. Not just that the knowledge exists, but that both parties are aware that it's shared. And then it truly does become common and can perhaps be used in important ways for uh, changing the, the behaviors that people engage in, both linguistic and non-linguistic. So the, the classic way that people talk about this is that common ground can accumulate over time. So let's imagine a very simple situation where there are two complete strangers, and they're, for some reason, together. Maybe they're waiting for a bus. Okay. So you might have two people, and they're going to have very little of a way of overlapping uh, common ground, and therefore, that might well constrain the kinds of things they even talk about with each other. On the other hand, imagine people who have known each other for several decades. I tell my undergraduate to imagine their married grandparents. So imagine people who have been married for prolonged periods of time. Intimates are going to have a huge amount of shared common ground, a huge amount of shared uh, knowledge that they know is shared knowledge. And that might have a very different kind of impact on the language that's used and the way that people speak to each other. We all know that intimates sometimes have their own kind of language in terms of code words or reference that nobody else is going to understand. And the way that this accumulates or grows over time is this conversing slow idea over the course of days, weeks, months, years, and possibly even decades the um, common ground might then exert huge impacts on how language is used and how it's understood as you're speaking to somebody with whom you share this, this large amount of common ground. Yes? Just to be doubly clear, mm -hmm. common ground doesn't necessarily mean any agreement at all. It seems like you could be have an intimate enemy oh, yes. if you share uh -huh. lots of common ground. Yeah, okay. you, could, uh, you could disagree with somebody almost completely on everything. But as long as you know that you disagree, yeah. And it has nothing to do with consensus at all. It has everything to do with um, what a person knows that the other person knows. But would you go so far as to say you can't disagree until you have common ground? Well, the, the disagreement isn't very um, salient. You have misunderstanding without common ground. Right, yeah. I'm just playing with I'm ripping off the hand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, it's you really have to have at least something shared for anything to occur behaviorally. So let's imagine some people waiting for a bus. You can just see the joy dripping off these people <laughs> waiting for the bus. I found this great image on Google. I thought it was wonderful. So, um, what can you talk about? What could one of these few people? They got bored enough just sitting there next to these other people. What could they choose to talk about? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's going to be a pretty constrained number of things they can talk about. They could, for example, talk about the weather. They could talk about the latest bus. <laughs> or if it's, a, if it's in Memphis, they could say, well, how about those tigers? How about those rivers? <laughs> so it's really hard to go much beyond that because you don't know what the other person knows and therefore can't exploit. Any kind, of, any kind of common ground that would be true for relationships you have with people who aren't strangers. So why these topics? Well, Clark himself talks about this in a book that I really strongly recommend to anybody who hasn't looked at it. This is his kind of magnum opus, Using Language from the mid-90s. And he had a whole chapter on common ground in this book. And he points out that two people will always share community membership, or not, I guess if you always have Earth, if we're all Earthlings, I guess you, you share that community membership. Uh, but that would explain the case of Memphis. You can make a reference to the Grizzlies or the Tigers if you're waiting at a bus stop because you know that the purse is in Memphis. They at least heard of the back of the sports teams, and that would be, that would be uh, permissible. And we have what he calls physical co-presence, the idea being here that there are certain things that you and I are perceptually experiencing at the same time. The weather is fair game because you're experiencing it, and I'm experiencing it, and we both know that we're experiencing it. 
And you can also have what you call linguistic cultural presence. You hear your first, it's not actually present, like the bus. It hasn't shown up yet. Um, and because that's a rough break that by definition, if you're at a bus stop, chances are you're there for a very specific reason. You aren't probably killing time, you're probably there waiting for the bus. So you can actually invoke the bus linguistically. It's not physically present like the weather is, but you can invoke it and talk about it in that way as well. Well, what if you're really bored and the bus is really late? Can you push it? Let's do a little thought experiment here with what you could do in a situation like this. So we're, um, oh, before I get to that, let's talk a bit, a bit about community membership. I'm sorry, I added this slide last minute. Um, so let's think about this actually at a, at a larger scale than just um, uh, maybe a, like a couple of people in the same town. You can imagine this playing itself out at a cultural level as well. So Edward Hall published a really interesting book uh, called Beyond Culture, uh, a cultural anthropologist. And he said, well, we can think about culture as varying in, ter in terms of what he calls high context and low context, kind of on a continuum. But at one end, there would be what he refers to as low context cultures in which shared cultural context is not assumed. And in such a situation, Paul points out, Information has to be stated explicitly. You can't assume that somebody else knows something. And as examples, he would include countries like Germany, the Scandinavian countries, and the US under this category. On the other extreme, we have what we call high contact cultures. And here, interestingly, the shared cultural context is assumed. We do assume that we all share the same cultural context. And as a result, many things are simply left unsaid. This would include uh, countries like China, Japan, Korea, and France. One of my former graduate students now works for the State Department as a Foreign Service Officer. And he's actually spent time living in Japan and Korea. And, and he, he tells me constantly about how weird it is because people just assume that you know things, even foreigners are assumed to know certain cultural things, and people don't explain anything to you. He's constantly confused. <laughs> he spent the summer in Mongolia, which apparently is even worse. And uh, all of the foreign service officers just look at each other and say, it's Mongolia. We have no idea what's going on here. Nobody tells us anything. So uh, that shows you how this process plays itself out actually on, on a much larger scale as well. But for our purposes, let's, let's jump back down to the more uh, fine grain level. Yeah. So that might imply that strangers talk more in these cultures. In um, China, Japan, Korea, and France, because they have more to talk about. Well, not necessarily, because remember, a lot of things that people talk about aren't necessarily very deep or very important. Mm -hmm. So if somebody in a, a low context culture committed suicide, for example, the family might spend a lot of time discussing it and explaining why this happened. In Japan, if somebody commits suicide, you just don't talk about it because it's assumed that you know from Japanese culture the reasons a person would do it. There are also more taboos, perhaps, about certain topics. And even the taboos are assumed to be known. You just don't talk about certain things. It's like certain dysfunctional families, if you put it that way. There are just these, 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 these minefields that you just don't get into. And the idea would be that this can actually play itself out on a world of culture as well, and on a much larger scale. Well, let's jump back to the bus stop. And, oops, once again, I changed my order. So let's hold off on that. Um, let me introduce another term here. This is actually a term that I created a while back. And it has not it kind of caught on very well, so I'm, 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 I'm plugging it again today. The idea of referability words still tells me it's not spelled correctly, but that's the word I've made up. So about 20 years ago, I said that, well, we need some way of describing this process. So inferability refers to how likely is it that your listener will understand you as you intended. Not the words you use, but actually what you intended behind that. And the idea might be that we can apply a very simple heuristic. Once again, a little nod to, to Kahneman here. You can do this in a kind of simple rule of thumb sort of way. If inferability is low, we should make a few assumptions about what our listeners are going to be able to understand as we speak to them. So we're going to explain things, and then this loops back to one of my primary research interests, 
we're going to probably use literal and conventional language with them because we can't assume they're going to understand anything that is more complex than that. On the other hand, if inferability is high, <laughs> anything goes. It's the wild west. I should do whatever I want. I should be able to, say, able to say scandalous, horrible, awful things. And no matter what I say, it doesn't matter. I can use my little language. I can throw the grassy maxims out the window. There goes quantity. There goes quality. It doesn't matter. I can say anything that I want. Well, let's think about how this might play itself out. Here we go. Here's my bus stop. Finally. <laughs> so I am staying at the bus stop. Um, I'm wearing the same shirt. <laughs> That's kind of creepy. <laughs> okay. So I, I'm at the bus stop, and let's say that there is this stranger that was indicating this person about a face. <laughs> Here's a tip. Don't do a Google image search for faceless man. You will see things you can never unsee. So don't, don't do that. But that's how I got that image. So imagine, and you're at the bus stop, and I'm just really bored, so I, I say to this person, I can't wait to vote for my man. <laughs> would I do that? And if I did, what would happen? Well, according to what we've seen on the previous slide, this should be a case where inferability is relatively low. The stranger is probably not going to know how to deal with that. It might, in fact, um, uh, come to the conclusion that I might be a little bit dangerous. <laughs> so, for that reason, I might assume that I shouldn't say something sarcastic, let's say, to a complete stranger. They don't know who I am. They don't know that I am not a Trump follower, so it could be a problem. Let's try a, a kind of intermediate case. I'm going to use Stephanie here as my victim for this one. <laughs> so I've had the pleasure of getting to know Stephanie over the past couple of years, and it's been wonderful. But there are certain things we haven't ever talked about. I'm pretty sure that we have never had a political conversation, for example. So what if I said this to Stephanie? Not to a stranger, but somebody that I know that I haven't discussed politics with. In this case, inferability should be medium, right? So Stephanie might think to herself, well, I know he's not insane, <laughs> but I don't really know if he's kidding or not. She might not be very sure. Let's consider the extreme uh, case of uh, high inferability. Let's uh, replace Stephanie with a good friend of mine, Bob Cohen. I've known Bob for decades. We have lunch frequently. We discuss politics endlessly, <laughs> all the time. Much more so than we should. Just, we get very worked up about it. <laughs> if we're in this case would be high, I could very easily say this to Bob, and he could very easily respond uh, with a similar kind of sarcastic claim as well. Right? <laughs> so we're both on the same page. We both understand that I'm speaking this highly uh, 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 unconventional way and there will be no real uh, possibility of confusion in that case. So I would argue that inferability is a good way of thinking about this because it does give us a sense of how we might try to make use of shared knowledge and experiences for deciding whether or not to use riskier forms of language, things like non-literal language. It'd be helpful if we lived in a world where people were more explicit. So in an episode of the Big Bang Theory, um, Sheldon Cooper, who is irony impaired, is being helped out by his long-suffering roommate, uh, Penny Ears Pissed, and uh, Blair is pointing out that she is in fact being sarcastic. We don't get that in the real world, unfortunately. This would be really cool if that's how we but uh, it happens to live in that world. So it is the case that we have to infer these things for ourselves. So, how does it work? Inferability might be computed, question mark, we don't really know. Using common ground, well, we don't really know that for sure either. That might be complicated, or it might in fact be simpler. It might just be the case that we make a guess about this based upon the relationship, the relationship status that we share with somebody else. Well, if Facebook has taught us anything, it's that relationship status is complicated. <laughs> so this may or may not be a useful approach, but it certainly seems like one possible way that people might short-circuit this otherwise very complex inferential process and make sense of 
Can I use sarcasm? Or, or should, I, should I play it safe? Uh, we, should, we might be able to um, uh, do something more simple to try to uh, compute exactly how much shared knowledge we have with somebody else. So one line of evidence, I, I stress that this particular finding is correlational. So it's not, the, 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 take your credits for it, but it is interesting correlation, I think. This is something I did about 20 years ago. We brought people into the lab and simply gave them a very long list of different kinds of relationships that they have with other people. And it was across the entire gamut from people who are basically strangers to us, like servers in restaurants or store clerks, ranging to people that we might know a little bit more, our parents' friends, for example, to people that we know pretty well, uh, all the way to intimates, like a sibling, significant others, parents, and so on. And we simply asked people to estimate how close they felt to these different types of relationship categories on a, a scale. Higher numbers mean you feel close to that, to that type of person. We thanked those folks, sent them away, brought new people to the lab, and gave them the exact same list of relationships. So it's a very wide-ranging list from very close to very intimate. And we asked them a very different question. We said to them, how often do you use sarcasm with these people? Now note that this is actually uh, between subjects. It's not a very hard way of doing the experiment. In fact, we were kind of tying our hands behind our back by doing it in a very weak sort of way. But we wanted to see if even as a between subjects sort of uh, measure, we would see any kind of relationship between closeness on the one hand and degree of sarcasm use on the other. So we can actually create the table here. We have on our y-axis sarcasm use. Up means you're using it more. Degree of closeness, as you go to the right, you feel close to these people. And here are the points. It tells a pretty good story. It turns out that we're able to explain about 40% of the variance in sarcasm use, simply based on other people's judgments about how close people feel to particular sorts of people in their lives. The points actually fall pretty much on a narrow band here in the middle. So only really one outlier right here. It turns out to be your grandparents. <laughs> People feel close to grandma and grandpa, but they may not use sarcasm with them for actually some very good reasons. They might assume, for example, that it might be seen as being uh, impolite or inappropriate. It might be the case that people infer that old people use language differently than young people. So there might be a whole bunch of things going on there to explain that point. At some point in the future, I want to explore that, but for now, it's just kind of interesting to note. There's only, only one point that's really far off the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the midline here. So it does look like there might be simpler ways of dealing with inferability than trying to keep track in a very labor-intensive way of how much common ground we share with other people. So we've been talking so far about the simple case. We have speakers and maybe one or more addressees. But in fact, things can be a lot more complicated than that. Imagine you're at a party. You may be talking to somebody or maybe several other people, and there might be what are referred to as side participants, people who are not really closely following the conversation, but, but they're there and might occasionally chime in, but they're not really the center of attention the way you and your, your addressees are. There might be bystanders, people who are nearby, who could enter into the conversation, but they're even more distant than these hot participants. There might be people who are not part of the conversation in any way, but simply overhearing what's being said in your vicinity. And there might be somebody in the next room pressing a glass to the wall who's actually eavesdropping on the conversation. So you can see there are lots of different ways this can play itself out. And if we have to think about common ground as something that you keep track of, this gets very complicated, doesn't it? We have to keep track of exactly what role people were playing. Not just what was said, but perhaps what role people were playing in that particular interaction. Overhearing is hard. You've probably all had the experience of overhearing a conversation you couldn't understand. If you ever eavesdrop in restaurants, I have to admit, I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of this. You know, sometimes the tables are really close together, and you hear these really interesting conversations. You're kind of trying to hear what they're saying, and sometimes they're really hard to understand. 
because, of course, the person creating the language who is speaking isn't intending you to be able to understand. They're intending it for their addressee. You can see this example of this in a movie that's not kind of dated, actually. But back in the late 80s, there was a movie called Broadcast News. If you weren't alive in the late 80s, you're going to make me feel very old, but that's certainly possible here. Uh, it was a romance comedy, romantic comedy with uh, um, uh, William Hurt, Albert Brooks, uh, Holly Hunter. It's your basic love triangle. Albert Brooks is in love with Holly Hunter. Holly Hunter is in love with William Hurt, and William Hurt is in love with himself. <laughs> <laughs> and in this movie, it's made very clear that Albert Brooks and Holly Hunter are very close. And one of the ways, very, very, I think, very nicely that the uh, scriptwriters made that clear was by this conversation that Albert Brooks and Holly Hunter have on the phone during the course of the movie. Albert Brooks says, I'll meet you by the thing near the place we went that one time. <laughs> Holly Hunter replies, okay. <laughs> She's perfectly fine with that. But it does, I think Amity who sees that scene in the movie thinks, wow, they must really know each other really well for this very egocentric, bizarre statement by Albert Brooks to make any sense at all to anybody. Obviously, she, he and, and Holly Hunter are, are, are very close. So this is the kind of thing that you have to deal with as an older hearer. If the utterances aren't being crafted in such a way that there's any kind of inferability or common ground that's directed towards you, it's going to be difficult to understand the kind of idiosyncratic things that people might spontaneously use when inferability is high or when common ground is uh, at a larger degree. So, keeping track of all of this, monitoring all of this is non trivial because don't just think about maybe one other person. Think about the fact that we're doing this for many, many people. We all have conversations over the course of months or years with hundreds of other people. The relationships are of very different types. Some of them very intimate, some of them very, uh, uh, very much an acquaintance. Sometimes they're just uh, completely uh, random conversations with people that you'll never see again. And we're talking about this unfolding over very long periods of time, once in decades, decades of time. Do we have any evidence that people can cope with this? Well, we could bring people to the lab for you know three or four years and observe them as they become increasingly frantic and kidnap them and <laughs> try to you know, tone their way out. That problem's not the way to go. In general, any kind of long-term longitudinal stuff's gonna be hard. But there might be some analogs that we could use that would work. And I'm gonna speak briefly about the work of a colleague who is not here, shame on him as well, Art Racer who realize that this is what people do when they read stories, when they read novels. You have to keep track of all those people in the book. Some books have lots of characters. And in some cases, crucially, you have to keep track of who knows what. In a mystery, for example, if everybody knew everything, there would be no mystery. So it's rather important, sort of crucial, that people are actually keeping track of who said what and who knows what. And our, uh, and actually Shen Yen and some other colleagues, uh, some people that you might know, who were involved in this research, found that people are pretty good at this. That at least for stories or, 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 or short pieces of fiction, people are able to keep up. They are able to um, monitor how all this works and can make inferences that are appropriate. Does X know about Y? Well, X was present when Z was said by Y, but I don't think they were listening, so I'm going to assume not. People are very good at making those kinds of inferences. Obviously, in some situations it might be easier, in some situations it might be harder. In highly conventionalized situations, like maybe in a soap opera, it's going to be pretty easy. We can keep track of the fact that Susan knows that Deb is carrying Chad's baby. <laughs> uh, and think about the implications it's going to have for everybody else. It might be, in fact, much harder when the rules of the game are not clear. So if you're watching a TV <laughs> series about some people who are stuck on a mysterious island, it might be much harder to make inferences about how things work and what people know because it's so unfamiliar in terms of the uh, situation and the things that happen in those contexts. Well. Things don't stand still. 
people have suggested alternative approaches to those that we started with, namely a purely audience-centered design or some sort of initially egocentric approach or maybe just priming. And the students who read the chapter were exposed to this briefly, some work uh, by Galati and Brennan on what they refer to as one-bit partner models. So this approach is very attractive because it doesn't require complex inferencing. It doesn't require the elaborate maintenance or updating of mental models over time. Me keeping track of why I said the Jason versus why I said the Stephanie over time. But none of that's really required. Instead, speakers simply need to keep track of a couple of alternatives. Hence the idea of one bit, on or off, yes or no. And that might buy you a lot. It might, in some cases, buy you enough to make it look like you are accumulating and keeping track of common ground. So in the chapter, the students read on uh, Galati and Brennan give some examples of this kind of thing. You can simply say to yourself, my conversational partner can see what I'm doing or not. My partner and I have spoken about this before or not. My partner is a young child as opposed to older. My partner is a native speaker of the language or not. You can see how making very simple judgments and keeping track of very simple binary sorts of alternatives might go a long way in allowing you to uh, make sense of, um, from not make sense of, but, but deciding how to use the language in a way that's going to be appropriate for your for your listener. Yeah. While you can call it a one bit while they call it a one bit alternative, it still seems like it adds up to storing a lot of information about your partner. Right. Well it gets several times. I'm not convinced this is the way to go. I'm I'm telling you that this is one proposal that seems to work really well for certain simple things, but I'm not sure it works for the conversing slow stuff. It might work for the conversing fast stuff, mm -hmm. but for the slow stuff across hours, days, and decades, I must what I'm saying is, how do they constrain this with enough bits? You have a ton of information. So. Yeah, uh, the question is, how many of these do you have to, have to know? Yeah. Yeah. And do they say it very few then, also? Or? They, they don't, they don't say. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't know. But I think you're right. I think you could, if you had a few thousand of these, yeah, right. do pretty well. But then you're back to the same problem you had before. You're keeping track of lots of information. That's exactly right. It seems more for the benefit of experimental design than anything else. You know, you just manipulate a single variable and you have a nice thin study. Very good. Yeah, it's very nice to pro designs this way. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's certainly true. But that doesn't feel to me as an explanation for the behavior either. Well, there have certain, this has certainly become a, a big area of controversy just in the last few years. In fact, there was a paper that was published last month which claims that common ground is simply an illusion. Uh, there's this term, the new ideas in psychology. And this really is kind of a new idea. But it's a good idea. I'm not really sure. The <laughs> crucial thing here, what I've marked, is on our view, the technical notion of common ground is an illusion because appeal to representation blinds theorists to bodily activity and the role of experience. These authors, who I don't know very much about, are basically arguing for a radical embodied approach. So if you're familiar with embodied cognition, you can take it to a very great Gibsonian kind of extreme and argue that the world provides affordances for what you and I have talked about, and that we might be able to offload this stuff. So this is a very non-representational, some might claim anti-representational account, mm. which I'm not very comfortable with, but I'm very glad that people are talking about it, because clearly it's the case that none of these solutions seems to work all that well. Common ground seems intuitively plausible, but it does require a great deal of cognitive expense. Radical embodied views are much simpler, but whether they can actually account for the nuances of real conversation, I think it's much less clear. Yeah? I don't know why they want to deny that the brain is very complicated and very powerful. It uses a lot of calories, it burns a lot of heat, 
And so why shouldn't we assume it's doing a lot? But anyway, yeah. <laughs> Um, so Stephanie has asked each of us to close our, our, our presentations with the same uh, slides. I think it's a brilliant idea, by the way, so there's a little bit of coherence here. Great. We're coming back each time to this question of why are dynamics important? And if you've been awake for the past hour, hopefully you already know what the answer is. Just in case you don't, let's just kind of summarize this. Conversations, by definition, are behavioral acts that are occurring over time. What describes our conversations work over short time scales, what I've talked about here as conversing fast, in which we studied a great deal in the laboratory, may or may not say very much about what was happening over longer time scales, what I'm calling here uh, conversing slow. But clearly, a complete theory of discourse is going to need to account for both of these things, both over conversing fast over short time frames but also will be much longer time frames as well. All right, thank you. All right, great, uh, great talk. I want to, I actually sort of want to springboard off the talk a little bit in the spirit of the seminar and make another comment about where dynamics uh, has been helping me just recently. Uh, especially, I don't know if you want to follow me back, but you had a slide full, you're very in the beginning of terms mm -hmm. that included synchrony and entrainment and matching and convergence and alignment. And um, I said recently, you know, I don't need to refer to specific articles, but the concept of dynamics that I think I try to convey also, especially in the form of physics, is very bound to temporality. Mm -hmm. And I uh, find it useful to distinguish those terms that require temporality yeah. from those that don't. And, you know, I'm actually going to go ahead and bash, um, run in a little bit for using okay. the word in China. Okay. Specifically. I mean, the idea that narrowing down to a single word is, has, doesn't, well, it develops over time. Maybe I shouldn't distract my main point by that example. The main point, again, is that coupling, entrainment, synchrony, coordination require that things happen at a certain time. Yeah. And others of these convergence, collaboration, alignment, adaptation, accommodation can happen whenever the yeah. able matching. A specific article I want to share with you is that they, it turns out that if you measure both in a conversation, they make extremely different uh, predictions. Oh, yeah. So I, I would like to suggest again that some of those are truly grounded in physical dynamics and others are more uh, analogies. As, as, part of our, as part of our grant, I was going to write a, a review paper trying to actually make sense of all this terminology oh, yeah, of the papers I'm, I'm, that, 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 that refer to it. I got partially into the process and realized I would never come out again. <laughs> I'm a little worried. I'm, I'm, I'm making that effort too, but I'm, again, the point is that I'm finding it very useful to, to take those that are truly grounded in, yeah. in, 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 in the in the purest sense of the word dynamics, meaning that there has to be a, a temporal trajectory in, as part of the definition. Yeah, looking at it across one dimension like that is much more attractive. And I think that, that would be a very worthwhile thing to do. I, mean, I, 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 I share your intuition about that. And, and you wish me luck, right? I do. <laughs> it's, it's a good job. Yeah. All right. Well, I think this is a place where that discussion can continue. That's right. No? I kind of just have one brief intuition in support of the idea that it's some sort of knowledge-based common ground, which is uh, it's just an intuition in my own experience when I meet researchers. Yeah. Uh, if they do research in memory or tutoring systems, I, I instantly have common ground with them. Right. Uh, and it's because of the information they share. Uh, I might not even like them, yeah. you know, but I have common right. ground. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's something that people almost always do when they first meet, especially academicians. It's a small world. You can always almost always find, oh, you know, so-and-so went to school with him, or he was his advisor, that kind of thing. So, yeah, uh, people spontaneously will try to figure this out. It works different ways in, in different cultures. In Korean, it's really important, you know, how old somebody is, so you can use the right grammatical structure. And the idea of somebody asking a woman how old they are in our culture, within the first half minute of meeting them, strikes me as being really a bad idea. <laughs> but, you know, there are going to be cultures where that part of, 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 of that has to be um, that has to be shared uh, very early on for the conversation to actually proceed. So it plays itself out in all sorts of interesting ways. Yeah.
questions? Sorry. Go ahead. No, no. <laughs> All right, okay. I so, so um, I have a bunch of questions, but uh, I was thinking when you talk about the short time scale of conversation, even within that, you have um, you have time scales, you know, different time scales going on during a conversation, right. right? And different levels of, you know, language processing happening with different time scales. But what I was thinking is, the, there might be the people themselves might have different speeds of thinking. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, um, like sarcasm, it happens really quickly. Yeah. And for for you to say something like. Oh, you know, go Donald Trump, um, and you know Bob to to reply and uh, with a sarcastic remark. Those kinds of things happen really quickly, but it's also a function of it seems like individuals. Some individuals are more adept yeah. at processing that kind of thing very quickly, um, and something as complex as sarcasm. So can it be an individual difference, too, yeah. I guess is my question. There's lots of recent research on this idea that people might uh, differ in terms of how often they use certain kinds of language, how quick they are to understand it correctly. Uh, one of my colleagues in Alberta had developed a sarcasm scale where she actually has shown that people who claim to use it a lot often understand it more quickly than people who don't use, pretend to use it very often. So it certainly is the case that there might be some really crucial individual uh, differences. And even just making very on-the-fly sorts of determinations. If I'm trying to tell you something and I'm with the industry of vacuum powder and busy, I might not be sarcastic because I might think, wow, that's kind of a lot to you know, keep track of. So you know, there might be all sorts of factors that are playing a role there in terms of uh, what I choose to say and how I choose to say it. Yeah. Jim? I think you said a little bit about this sarcasm and the at one point, but um, you're talking about cost of saying something sarcastic or the, how cost plays a role in the principle of inferability. Right. So, um, you know, so if, we, if we're talking about in terms of common ground, how much, what is it going to cost me to accidentally say something about Donald Trump and being serious, right. you know, like to you versus, I don't know. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but I'm just wondering about so that I think that that might hurt. Yeah, there, there are consequences. Yeah. You say. Yeah, and it it might hurt your principle a little bit. It might. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it certainly is the case that uh, shooting the breeze and, and just trading barbs about uh, current events is very different than uh, having a more consequential conversation, and that might have some sort of impact on credibility and, and the whole uh, expense cognitive of keeping track of these things. I thought it kind of might refer to the grandparent outlier. Oh, okay, yeah. I don't know. I mean, one of the reasons I used that example was that when I was about, I guess, maybe 25, I was sitting in my grandparents' house, and my grandmother was reading the newspaper, and so she stands up, walks over to my grandfather, and shows him the front page of the paper. He looks at it, he looks back at her, she goes and sits back down again, completely satisfied. What's <laughs> 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 one argument? Right? They had a whole conversation. Yeah. All she had to do was expose the information to my grandfather. Yeah. She already knew what he would think. Yeah. She just didn't know that he knew it. Yeah. And so you get these really interesting things. At that point, they've been married about 40, 50 years. And so you should prove something to them. Yeah, <laughs> that probably is right. Uh, so it's, it really does change how explicit you have to be. It really becomes a very different form of communication. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I have one more. Sure. One more. Sure. So the uh, beginning of the talk, when you were talking about the shorthand. Uh -huh. I was hoping you were going to touch on how that might be happening, happening at an evolutionary time oh, scale. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, so, so actually my students asked me this uh, yesterday, and I had to say I, I have no idea how to answer this question. Mm -hmm. um, they said, are, are languages moving toward shorter, simpler structures? And I've seen different... Um, people talking about this 
It's claimed that things like Indo-European or grammatical are syntactically very complex, and that some of the descendants of, of that original, well, of that proto-language have become much grammatically simpler. English has become simpler than some of the languages that it evolved from. So there's certainly one line of evidence that there might be important ways in which things become simpler over time. Well, there was that whole distinction that Gale discovered, Gale and who was that? Yeah, yeah. Oh, so the exoteric, esoteric. Right, right, that's right. The complexity argument based on the size of the culture. Well, the historical linguistics provides all kinds of evidence that are European. It's not, it's not, well, that's not doubtful. That's completely clear. Mm -hmm. Proto Indo European was an enormously more complicated language grammatically than any of its scholars, including all the ones that we think of as being complicated European languages. Yeah. Enormously more complicated. But that's not doesn't necessarily mean that there is no pressure under the circumstances for language to become more complicated. But don't you have to establish what the dimension is? I mean, they may be complex along one dimension, like syntax, but less complex. Yeah, the only dimension along which that statement applies is uh, something like morphal syntax. Because that's what you can examine uh, historically for uh, back enough, far enough in time so that you can make reasonable statements about it. Yeah, but the, so the point is that if it's only on that one dimension, then a statement like language become, you know, more or less complex over time doesn't really make we, we can't make such a statement. Well, it's not, I'm, I'm just talking about Indo-European. I'm not talking about language. Right, right. But, in, but you said, but Indo-European only on that one dimension of, of morphal syntax. Well, so it's, it, it's more than one dimension because morphal syntax includes an enormous number of possible properties. And, uh, and there, there have been simplifications on declension, on gender, on I mean, everything you can mention, conjugation, case, all of them have been simplified in all the daughters of the year. But at the same time, the lexicon is probably exploded. Oh, I mean, that, that's a wholly different question. A whole different question. And, and, and other languages, uh, I mean, the only against the conjecture is, and I think it's a sensible one, that if you isolate a language and you have relatively small numbers of speakers, then the pressure will be sort of complicated rather than to, rather than to simplify. What simplifying languages is broad numbers of non-native speakers coming in to the setting of the language. I have a question, though, which you have to apply about the cultural matter. I, mean, I, I was kind of stunned to hear this idea when you attributed to Andrew Hall. Mm -hmm. About these high context and low context cultures. It, it could be just misinterpreting um, cultural norms for questions about context. I mean, I, I think that, for example, why couldn't you just imagine that the reason Chinese or Japanese or Korean people don't uh, talk to, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what the, what the is measuring, but I mean, you have, it, it's widely discussed, and I think I have experienced myself with people from. Uh, those cultures that uh, they, they they have more reserve about what they're willing to talk about. That's certainly true, but I think it goes beyond that. I think the assumption is, at least from what I've I've heard from people who spent long periods of time in Japan, is that there are certain things that people just think it's you're, you're, you're stupid or crazy for asking those those questions. So my my, my, my former student Richard asked somebody in Mongolia recently, you know, why do you have this architectural detail on houses? And the person was like, it was crazy. Why would you ask that? You know, it's just yeah, it doesn't make it happen in Germany. Why do you have those uh, funny looking boards on the side of the people? Yeah. And, and people in Germany would know the answer. They might be white and really uneducated. But they might well they might respond more 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 readily. I'm sure, but I, I, I'm, I'm I'm still thinking, I am not sure that you, if I understood what you mm -hmm. interpreted Paul from saying, I'm right. not sure that that's what's going on. It's a question of shared context. As much as or shared context, in one case, a lack of it in the other. Well, it's certainly always very dangerous to talk about culture as one dimension because mm -hmm. there are a whole mm -hmm. bunch of things that are working together here. But he, he does, you know, map out this claim. I think, you know, regardless of whether or not it's correct or even generally true, he, he's, he's tapping into something that many other people have lost over the market on. What they actually inspire me to read the books. Just to give you an excuse to look at it. Um, and if there's always Wikipedia, it's not. Right? It's a short version of that one. So. <laughs>